Hello. Welcome to the seminar on the use of basic, basic metabolic testing in psychiatric disorders uh, using uh, two uh, case studies by other clinicians in which the laboratory was a, an extensive part of the diagnostic and, uh, and uh, uh, process and, and the follow-up treatment. And uh, it is a much calmer day in Kansas. Yesterday was uh, extremely exciting. We had a, uh, a, a real tornado warning, and the, the radio was indicating that the, the tornado was spotted just a couple of miles from the laboratory. So it was, it was a very, very uh, exciting day. And, we were discussing whether all the employees should huddle together and lock arms in case the the uh, twister started uh, pulling us up in the air. Would that help us to stay on the ground better? So luckily, it uh, it bypassed us and uh, and went on and just disappeared. So it's a much calmer night here in in Kansas City. Uh, there, for those who are looking at the control panel in the upper right, if you want to minimize the, the size of the control panel, if you will just click on the orange arrow, it will make the, the uh, icon uh, for the control panel much smaller. So the first case I'm going to discuss, it's a 43-year-old woman with a long-term history of depression, uh, uh, severe fatigue, anxiety, obesity, and, and also a, at, at one time a, uh, a diagnosis of bipolar depression. Uh, she was severely affected. She divorced from her husband and went to live in the basement of her sister's house with her three children. Uh, she was extremely distraught. She was on seven, seven different antidepressant drugs as well as anti-anxiety drugs as well. And she was treated by a clinician who had attended the previous uh, IMMH conference last year. The clinician ordered uh, several different laboratory tests, comprehensive fatty acids, a IgG, or immunoglobulin G, food allergy test that included 93 foods plus uh, the uh, IgG antibodies to Candida, uh, a, a, a very common uh, pathogen in humans. Uh, she ordered a, an or, urine organic acids test, and a plasma amino acid test, and a peptides, opiate peptides in urine. So uh, let's uh, start off. This was the case from uh, Ann, Ann uh, Mendelssohn. And, and we'll start off with the uh, omega-3 uh, uh, fatty acids. So if we look here, we see that she had considerable amount of DHA. This was probably from some degree of supplementation. But the other thing that's very interesting is if you look at the amount of the omega-6 fatty acid, linoleic acid, it, the amount is, uh, is extremely elevated, the bar going far to the right. And remember, these are these are reference ranges, so reference ranges don't necessarily mean healthy ranges. These are just these are the ranges that are found in people in the particular population who are not sick at the time that the uh, sample is drawn. So just remember that that the uh, normal ranges are not the same as optimal ranges or ranges for the uh, best health uh, necessarily. So uh, what you see here is a very high value of the omega-6 fatty acid, linoleic acid, and uh, indicating a very large intake of vegetable oils. And if you look down further, you also see uh, high amounts of uh, uh, higher 
than the average amounts of arachidonic acid, which is associated with uh, inflammation. Going to the second page of the fatty acid panel, it's interesting that the saturated fatty acids are, are, um, are on the very low side of the uh, normal range for the medium chain uh, and some of the longer chain fatty acids. A large number of these are on the very low side of normal. Uh, going down further, there's a category called branch chain fatty acids. Uh, these are of importance mainly in certain of the genetic diseases called peroxisomal uh, disorders in which very elevated amounts of these things would be found. So th these are really not a, a important factor in this particular patient. <clears throat> Going on to the third page of the report, this is where the, the different amounts of fatty acids are, are summarized. So uh, let's start down at the bottom. Uh, there's 11.2 millimoles per liter of, uh, of all the fatty acids found in the uh, serum comprehensive fatty acid test uh, that is in the middle of the normal range, but the saturated fat is very low. There's some discussion about that that saturated fat is, is essential and that perhaps people are eating uh, uh, not enough saturated fat. Uh, the monounsaturated fat, for example, an example is uh, olive oil high in oleic acid is on the lower side. The polyunsaturated fatty acids are elevated, uh, but then the polyunsaturated fatty acids are made up of o primarily of omega-3 and, and uh, omega-6 with with uh, uh, some omega-9s, but primarily the uh, most of these uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids come from omega-3 and omega-6. So look here, the omega-6 fatty acids are 5.8 millimoles per liter, whereas the omega-3 is 0.5. So the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, just eyeballing this, is uh, nearly... 12-fold, which is uh, an imbalance. It's estimated that the, uh, the, the values for maximum or optimal health are in the range of 1 to 2 for the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So summarizing this in the same patient, there are two ways that are used for summarizing this. One measure is the ratio of linoleic acid, the predominant omega-6, uh, divided by the amount of alpha-lenolenic acid, or ALA, uh, one of the predominant omega-3s. And you see in this particular patient, the, the, uh, the value is 60.4 in the patient. It's estimated that our Paleolithic ancestors who were in, in much better health, the ratio was actually less than one. So a 60-fold uh, excess of omega-6 compared to our Paleolithic uh, ancestors. And if you look at all the omega-6, and don't focus just on the linoleic acid because it's extremely high, the omega-6, the ratio of total omega-6 fatty acids to total omega-3 is 11.6, still uh, considerably higher than what's estimated uh, the diet of our Paleolithic uh, ancestors. And the reason why this is so important is that the high ratios of omega-6 to omega-3 are associated with diseases. And, and so even though this is a focusing on psychiatric disease, I think it's very important for to, to look at the other diseases that are also uh, associated with with uh, high ratios of omega-6 to omega-3. So, for example, cardiovascular disease, uh, atherogenesis, uh, most psychiatric diseases, cancer, inflammatory diseases such as arthritis, and autoimmune diseases like lupus are all associated 
with uh, high ratios of omega-6 to omega-3 like this lady has. The, the uh, inflammation-associated conditions, many studies indicate that cardiovascular disease and arthritis are, are associated with uh, inflammation, and, and several studies indicate that many other diseases, asthma, lung disease, uh, uh, irritable bowel disease, uh, at uh, atopic eczema, Alzheimer's cancer, trauma, and obesity are also associated with uh, inflammation. So this omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is extremely important in psychiatric illness, but also in illness overall. For So this is a very important concept because the brain does exist in an attached body. The uh, inflammatory response uh, is a, a response to infection or injury, and it's a natural part of the immune response, and so it is a beneficial thing. The problem is, is if the inflammatory response becomes uh, too predominant. So with excess inflammation, it, the inflammation becomes uncontrolled. It becomes inappropriate, for example, in causing the inflammation that, that uh, in essence, eats up the joint in, in, uh, in uh, arthritis and is excessive. Uh, what I've put together is a uh, scale that indicates the the type of diet or illness, and uh, and and on the scale are rated the different ratios of omega six to omega three. And this is a logarithmic scale. The top value here is a uh, hundred, which of course would be an extremely abnormal value. And down here uh, at the at the bottom is the uh, is the ratio of one, uh, two being here. So this in this region here, this this is considered the optimum uh, wellness diet for that was that was present for our Paleolithic uh, ancestors, and in 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 modern humans, uh, this was the diet that was present in Greece before before the uh, diet became uh, packaged and additives and everything else. So, so the Greek diet before 1960 uh, uh, followed pretty much the Paleolithic diet of our caveman ancestors. And so this is considered the optimum diet for uh, low amounts of inflammation, uh, excellent mental health, as well as uh, cardiovascular health. Um, the, it's been found that a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of less than two and a half uh, has, is an anti-cancer diet. It actually suppresses uh, cancer growth. It's been found that the current Mediterranean diet is a, has a ratio of about 2.6. It's found that if your ratio is four or below, which is the common uh, Japanese diet today, which is which is predominantly a high fish diet, that it, it's associated with a 70% decrease in cardiovascular disease. Also, that values below four are associated with good mental health as well as cardiovascular health. And the particular patient remember, had a ratio of 11.2. So the patient is up here. Uh, it's found that, that uh, asthma for, uh, severity is higher if the ratio was more than five. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and becomes more, very severe at 10. The typical Western diet, the ratio is 15 to 20. So the patient had a somewhat lower value because she had already started taking some supplements of uh, fish oil. The, the, the worst diet on earth appears to be the urban India diet uh, with a ratio of uh, 38 to 50, whereas the rural India diet, in and, and which there is uh, much 
much more raw food and such as a much uh, better ratio. And I want to go uh, over the the uh, the different types of of uh, I, substances called eicosanoids that are produced from these different types of fatty acids. So the the predominant fatty acid found in cell membranes of the omega-6 family is called AA or uh, arachidonic acid. <coughs> the predominant uh, fatty acids in the person taking high amounts of of uh, fish oil or other sources of of uh, high omega-3 fatty acid are the uh, EPA, uh, eicosapentaenoic acid, or are, uh, or the uh, the DHA. So these are found in the cell membranes and then are released to f form free fatty acids. These free fatty acids can then be converted by enzymes into eicosanoids and the uh, EPA uh, fatty acids form, form eicosanoids such as prostaglandin uh, three, the thromboxane three, and the leukotriene five, which are less inflammatory than the eicosanoids produced by the uh, arachidonic acid, which result in uh, high amounts of inflammation. Matter of fact, I, I still remember the uh, article I had picked up that uh, injecting arachidonic acid, a very small amount, would, would cause instant death in a um, um, in 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 rabbits due to uh, formation of uh, clots, a very small amount would uh, injection of of arachidonic acid could be uh, easily fatal. So the these um, eicosanoids, which are substances derived from these fatty acids, include prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and thromboxanes. And they regulate the intensity and duration of the uh, the hormone-like response. Uh, and and uh, I mentioned arachidonic acid, which is abbreviated as AA, uh, produces this series of of uh, eicosanoids, which stimulate the production of of certain cytokines, proteins that regulate the immune system, and as well have an effect on behavior tumor necrosis uh, factor, uh, interleukin-1 and interleukin-6, whereas DPA and DHA products produce uh, less harmful eicosanoids. Uh, so this just uh, another, uh, another look at the, at the same thing, just summarizing again, EPA and DHA produce um, uh, eicosanoids that oppose inflammation, whereas arachidonic acid, AA, promotes inflammation. And the, uh, these uh, fatty acids have profound effect on, uh, on, on cardiac risk factor. Uh, so this shows that those who have the lowest amount of omega-3 fatty acids, this would be their, their um, a relative risk is just arbitrarily listed as one. The the person who has uh, who has the who are in the group that has the highest amount of omega three fatty acid have uh, twenty percent of the of the risk of sudden death from cardiac causes. So an extremely important factor in uh, as a cardiac risk factor and uh, a summary of fatty acid metabolism. This includes just the main. There's, there's some of the fatty acids are omitted, but uh, it's showing that linoleic acid, the main fatty acid, and the one that was present in such very high concentrations in the patient is converted to dihydrogamma linolenic acid and then on to arachidonic acid, whereas omega-3 fatty acids uh, can be produced from alpha linolenic acid, which is common in in uh, flaxseed uh, flaxseed oil, and and then that fatty acid is converted to EPA and DHA, but the enzymatic reaction is relatively weak, especially in some people don't have 
high amounts of the enzyme or don't have efficient enzymes due to genetic variants or nutritional deficiencies. And so there may be impaired conversion of the flaxseed oil to uh, EPA and DHA. And this is a, an important uh, aspect as far as treating uh, patients who are vegetarian. So you may want to put them on flaxseed oil be, because of their vegetarian uh, habits, but the problem is sometimes this is not a good um, this is not a good conversion. And so, uh, what is very very useful is is to uh, to use the EPA and DHA that are derived from algae. So those are available. They're more expensive, but can be used for uh, vegetarian patients. So the eicosanoids um, uh, regulate many different uh, aspects with their hormone-like actions in the body, and and uh, they can cause these these reactions uh, to occur right at the place where the eicosanoid is produced. They they can affect the tissues uh, surrounding the um, right in the vicinity. They don't have to go through the bloodstream. So the the omega-6 eicosanoids derived from arachidonic acid increase, increase blood clotting, increase inflammatory response, whereas the omega-3 inhibit those responses. The only thing is they can inhibit the uh, blood clotting, and if it becomes too severe, of course, then you could have a, a, a bleeding out if it became really severe. Uh, now I want to, to go to the IgG food allergy test that tells 93 of the most common foods. And, and, and I want to talk about these foods up here in the upper left, which, which are the, the foods derived from uh, milk. So there's casein, cheese, goat cheese, milk, mozzarella cheese, whey, and yogurt. And what you see is that there's that in this patient, virtually all of these milk-related proteins are elevated. The goat cheese is not elevated quite as much, but my finding in, in most individuals, if they're sensitive to cow's milk, they're also sensitive to goat's milk, as this person, even though the goat uh, milk reaction, and, and as far as the goat cheese, is not quite as intense, I would still say this person would, is going to do the best off all milk products. And this is an extremely important aspect in all of the psychiatric disorders. There's been really a, a barrage of papers in the last several years indicating that virtually every psychiatric disorder is associated with, with uh, uh, IgG milk allergy. Uh, so so uh, including the uh, bipolar depression, which is one of the diagnoses that this lady uh, had. In addition, she is also has significant allergy to pineapple, to almond, um, a less severe allergy to eggs, uh, but also a severe allergy to wheat. So these are by far the two most common uh, allergies in the population, uh, those to wheat and milk, which of course are the same ones that are so prevalent in the uh, Western diet. Uh, looking on the next page, she has uh, very high uh, allergies to sunflowers, and what I would suspect that this could be from the ingestion of large amounts of the of of the sunflower oil or from eating sunflower seeds, and I suspect that could be the reason why her omega-6 fatty acid linoleic was so high because of eat, uh, eating excessive amounts of the oil uh, or, or eating in excessive amounts of the seed. And in addition, the individual also has significant allergies to, uh, to common uh, yeast uh, used to make uh, beer and bread and a very severe allergy to uh, Candida albicans, a, a, a IgG reaction. As you look down 
here on the interpretation it indicates values greater than 5 are considered high, this person's value is 14. So this person has a really severe reaction to candida that, and, and this could indicate either that the person has got a severe yeast infection currently or that they had one in the past. You can't really tell uh, from this particular test, but you can know that candida is, has been a major problem for them uh, either now or in the past. So candida antibodies are in, measured in this test are IgG antibodies to candida associated with past or current infections. The candida antibodies frequently cross-react with virtually every human tissue, such as brain, thyroid, liver, or heart. So, so one aspect that's very important is even if these antibodies are due to previous reactions, they could still be very important because these antibodies uh, are cross-reacting uh, to human tissues. And a, a, one of the uh, psychiatric disorders in which a similar phenomenon is well known is that in Tourette syndrome in which antibodies cross uh, do antibodies generated by strep, streptococcus, uh, those antibodies cross-react with brain tissue and cause the, the abnormal behavior in ticks in Tourette syndrome. So I think it's very likely, although not as well researched, that these candida antibodies could be causing uh, significant uh, clinical uh, effects uh, as they cross-react with virtually every uh, human tissue, in, in, uh, including the brain. The high titers in this patient are also uh, indicate a, a severe candida problem. And the clinician, in this case, decided to treat the patient with an over-the-counter antifungal based on this test as well as an elevated uh, urine marker in the organic acid test. So this is the urine organic acid test. The, the, the compound under the category of yeast and fungal markers, carboxycitric, was elevated. Uh, none of the bacterial markers were elevated down here. Uh, and uh, on the second, second page, um, I want to bring your attention to the neurotransmitter metabolites, and I have a blow-up of that over here. So the, uh, the uh, homovanillic acid is abbreviated as HVA, is the uh, major metabolite of the neurotransmitter dopamine, whereas vanillyl mandelic acid, or VMA, is the major a metabolite of norepinephrine and epinephrine. So uh, in this particular graph, this is the entire normal range. The, the pinkish area is the area that includes uh, one standard deviation. So for, for both the HVA and VMA metabolites, the patient is, is on the lower end of the normal uh, range as far as being at least one standard deviation away from the mean value. In addition, the, the amount of 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid, the major metabolite of, of serotonin, is also on the low end of the normal scale. So in this case, because of these values being on the lower end, again, um, the clinician elected to give nutritional supplementation that would increase these uh, neurotransmitters uh, further into the normal range because of the history of depression. Uh, also, quinolinic acid, a substance that is associated with neuroinflammation and neurotoxicity, is on the higher end, and the ratio of quinolinic acid to the serotonin uh, indicates uh, some degree of, of abnormality. And the reason these are put together is both the quinolinic acid and the, and the metabolite of serotonin, 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid, are both derived from tryptophan. So what it's indicating is that, that a disproportionate amount of tryptophan 
is being is being funneled toward uh, quinolinic acid than is desirable. Um, in the next category, the next abnormal result here is under suberic acid. Uh, it's a, a slight elevation, but this elevation indicates that there's some uh, deficiency in the ability to metabolize fatty acids. So based on this abnormality, it was decided to supplement with uh, carnitine. You could use either carnitine itself or acetyl carnitine. And going on to the nutritional markers test, one of the things that is indicated is the vitamin B6 metabolite pyridoxic acid is on the low end of the normal range. So the idea was to supplement with B6. B6, of course, is involved in many of the, tra uh, the transformation of the neurotransmitters. Uh, vitamin C is low, and of course vitamin C is extremely important for as a reducing agent to prevent uh, free radical damage, and so supplementation of uh, vitamin C was done, as well as the precursor of glutathione in acetylcysteine was on the low end of normal range, and so it was also supplemented. Uh, going, on, uh, going on further, 2-hydroxyapuric uh, acid was slightly elevated, and, and the, one of the most common uh, sources of this is the, the aspartame, which is the, the trade name is NutraSweet. And many, many people have uh, depression or uh, migraine headaches or, uh, or, or chronic fatigue. Uh, associated with the use of NutraSweet. And so when I see this elevated, I always suggest that there's a history follow-up to see if the patient is using this and to suggest that, that the patient do a trial for a week of going without NutraSweet uh, in any form and see what happens uh, to their symptoms. But there are other sources. So this can include uh, salicylates from aspirin, and occasionally it might be from uh, a bacterial source in the intestine. Uh, there were they, none of the amino acid abnorm abnormalities were abnormal. Uh, and remember, uh, so they're, they're, some of these are very low, and but that doesn't necessarily mean harmful. For the amino acid metabolites, it's high values that are that are usually thought of as as being problematic. Low values may mainly indicate that the body is uh, processing and breaking down these amino acids for fuel uh, very efficiently. Uh, now on to the uh, metals testing uh, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, done in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the urine and the, the um, the values were, were, were pretty much normal with perhaps the manganese being a little bit on the elevated side. And so this is, this is questionable. And I think if the patient didn't do well, um, there might be a consideration to consider if perhaps manganese is too high and even consider chelation. But because it's still in the normal range, I think, I would probably uh, let it go unless the other treatments uh, didn't uh, resolve the the uh, the psychiatric symptoms. the The toxic elements were were all okay in the normal range, so they didn't seem to be um, uh, a major problem. And uh, amino acids were tested. Most of, most of the amino acids were, were uh, okay. There weren't any that appeared to be uh, deficient. There were a few of the branch-chained amino acids that were on the lower side. However, they were still uh, within the, uh, the normal range. They weren't in the extremely low category. So overall, I think my recommendation would just be that the person really does not need uh, any kind of additional 
uh, protein or amino acid supplementation. So now I'd like to summarize these, these uh, lab tests. So uh, first of all, the patient had many severe IgG food allergies, especially to milk products, which recent literature have indicated are strongly implicated in virtually every psychiatric disorder, including uh, bipolar disorder, psychosis, schizophrenia, and, uh, and autism. And there's new papers that are coming out almost on a daily basis. Uh, there was a marked excess of omega-6 fatty acids with very high values of linoleic acid and very low values of saturated fats. Uh, the organic acid test indicates low normal values of, of the metabolites of norepinephrine, dopamine, and, and serotonin. It also indicates low normal values of vitamin B6, of uh, extremely low values of vitamin C, uh, and the elevation of the uh, abnormal fatty acid indicates a probable deficiency of carnitine, and also there's a marker, the fungal marker carboxycitric is elevated, which together with the, the high antibodies against candida might indicate uh, uh, intestinal uh, yeast overgrowth problems. So the treatment embarked on was an elimination diet for all the foods in the moderate or high category, which included wheat, milk, cheese, yogurt, pineapple, almond, and, uh, sun, and sunflower. Because the linoleic acid is, was so high, it was recommended to reduce the amount of uh, vegetable oils used in salads and cooking and uh, such as sunflower and corn oils. It was recommended to increase the omega-3 fatty acids such as flaxseed oil and fish oil. And, and uh, I think a very good amount to use in most psychiatric cases would be to go up to 3,000 milligrams of EPA and uh, DHA. For common cod liver oil, this would be, this would be uh, 15 cc's a day of a uh, of a good brand of cod liver oil that has that that has uh, good amounts of uh, uh, EPA and DHA. Um, the monosaturated oils such as olive oil could replace the the uh, omega-6 fatty acids that in the uh, vegetable oil and be used for cooking. The patient was recommended to supplement 500 milligrams of tyrosine in the morning to increase norepinephrine and dopamine. So the, the, the recommendations for supplementation are for, for those that are the uh, catecholamine metabolites, it's recommended to, rec to supplement those in the morning because they make the person uh, alert concentrating and energetic, whereas the person was also deficient in the serotonin metabolite, but the serotonin is the one that causes a sense of relaxation and sleepiness, so that's better to be given at bedtime. So if you, uh, if you give this in the daytime, it can lead to the person being drowsy, which of course can be a problem if they're driving or, or uh, operating machinery or things like that. Um, I don't recommend the use of tryptophan itself because of the danger of a condition called eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. About 10% of patients who use tryptophan as a supplement for a short a period of time as a couple weeks develop this uh, eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, which can be uh, fatal. And the reason it's fatal is not because of impurity, which was the idea that first came out. It's due to the fact that tryptophan is converted to an excitatory and inflammatory neurotransmitter called quinolinic acid. So a very nice study was done that shown that the, the patients who had this, the, this severe uh, abnormality that uh, those people who were still suffering had high amounts of quinolinic acid uh, in their blood and urine, whereas people who had this disorder but got better 
at normal amounts of quinolinic acid. So uh, the entire disease has been reproduced in animals just by administering quinolinic acid. And since quinolinic acid is a metabolite of tryptophan, the most likely cause of this syndrome was due to the uh, simple supplementation of, of normal tryptophan. Um, vitamin B6 was supplemented because the values of B6 were in the low end of the, of the uh, reference range, and carnitine was, uh, uh, in this case, acetylcarnitine was, was recommended because of the high amounts of the branch chain fatty acid, the sebacic acid. Uh, melatonin was given at bedtime uh, to improve sleep. Uh, Candex was, is an over-the-counter uh, product used, by, uh, used to digest the candida cell wall. So that was, a, that was the only thing used to treat the candida was this Candex product, which uh, is available from New Beginnings. Um, other vitamins were really supplemented without evidence of deficiency. In other words, just to, um, uh, just to have a good balance of additional vitamins, but there, wasn't, there weren't biochemical markers that indicated deficiency. The clinician just decided to add these in for good measure. So these are the different uh, supplements that were, uh, that were added in to the uh, supplementation routine. Uh, one, of the, one of the nice things about this patient is the patient was very highly motivated. The patient wanted to get better, and they had excellent compliance with both the restricted diet and the supplement. So, so because the person liked milk a lot, they got a, uh, a rice milk uh, that was uh, chocolate flavored, and they they started using that instead of uh, instead of the uh, cow's or goat's milk. Uh, one of the additional side benefits of of these changes were is they uh, lost a lot of their uh, excess weight. They were very happy about that. So when they started, uh, they were on seven drugs. After uh, undergoing the, all these nutritional supplementation, they stayed with just the uh, uh, Cymbalta, uh, SSRI uh, inhibitor uh, drug. The bipolar disorder was completely under control. All the fatigue and depression was gone. The patient commented that they hadn't felt so good since their uh, 20s, their 43-year-old uh, individual. Um, they were uh, able to get a better job, moved out of the basement to their own house with their kids, and the clinician is very happy with the, the uh, success of this uh, integrative treatment. Now I'm going to turn to a, uh, a second uh, case study. This is a, uh, a boy with... Uh, with a four-year-old boy with attention deficit with hyperactivity, with some anxiety. The parents don't want to put them on the stimulant medications like uh, the, the, um, uh, the stimulant, the, the, uh, a number of different stimulant drugs that are uh, uh, used to uh, treat hyperactivity like Ritalin. And the preschool teacher reports that the child is very distractible and, and disrupts the classroom, that he's a very picky eater, he craves sugar, complains of stomach cramps, and, and he has uh, nervousness and making a lot of noise all the time. Um, in uh, examining the rectal area, it's all red, presumably uh, perhaps from... Uh, uh, candida problems of the uh, of the uh, rectum. His cheeks and ears are very red, presumably due to extreme food allergies. So the red cheeks and ears are a very common uh, symptom of of underlying food allergies. And so if you see that in a child, or for that matter, an adult, uh, the most common cause is the IgG uh, food allergies. He was hyperactive during the office visit, 
the uh, comprehensive testing was done that includes cholesterol. And cholesterol is extremely important, but not for what you might think of cholesterol excess. Cholesterol deficiency is a common factor in virtually every psychiatric disease. So even though high cholesterol increase, increases uh, cardiac risk factor in, in middle-aged men, uh, low cholesterol is just as serious a problem. He was also used this uh, ad, uh, cholesterol, uh, advanced cholesterol profile that includes the transport proteins for cholesterol, apolipoproteins, big A, big B, uh, and little a, which is in the serum, and also homocysteine, another cardiac risk factor, uh, but it's very important because it can indicate a functional inadequacy of uh, folate, B12, and B6. Uh, organic acids was done in the urine, the comprehensive stool test, a copper-zinc profile because copper-zinc imbalance is also commonly associated in, in a high percentage of psychiatric diseases, and he had a hair test done for toxic and essential metals, and and also had the IgG food allergy test. The cholesterol was low, so Great Plains Laboratory uses a, its own unique uh, reference range which, which includes low values for cholesterol as well as high. Most laboratories throughout the world only report high cholesterol values. Great Plains Laboratory reports low values. And the cutoff value of 160 was based on examining a wide range of clinical, stu clinical studies for a wide variety of disorders in which it was found that diseases of every type were more prevalent when the cholesterol dropped below 160. And then, and then also, um, specifically, it was guided by this particular study Association of Serum Cholesterol and History of School Suspension in School-Aged Children. So it was found that in non-African American children, if they had low cholesterol, meaning less than 145, this child, remember, was 138, they were almost three times more likely to have been suspended or expelled from school than controls with higher cholesterol values. And we've already seen with numerous children that, that uh, aggress aggression and self-aggression and aggression to others is markedly reduced with uh, uh, cholesterol supplementation or uh, putting increased eggs in the diet if the child isn't, uh, isn't allergic to eggs. Uh, again, these are all these supplements are available from New Beginnings. So cholesterol comes from two sources. It comes from the diet, and it also comes from the body. Uh, the average adult makes about 1,000 milligrams uh, of cholesterol a day, the, which is the amount that's in uh, four average eggs. So an egg has about 250 milligrams of cholesterol. The body makes an, the, about the same amount of cholesterol as four eggs. Um, cholesterol can be made from any of the major foodstuffs, fat, carbohydrates, and proteins, which are all converted to acetyl-CoA, which in turn is eventually uh, converted to cholesterol by a large number of steps. There's about 25 or 30 biochemical steps in here, and so I've greatly simplified this. Um, but the precursor of cholesterol is very important because it makes vitamin D. Um, it's also cholesterol is important for activating an important developmental protein called sonic hedgehog, which is maybe the reason why it's associated with uh, increased rates of autism as well as uh, increased uh, uh, abnormal aggressive behavior, inappropriate uh, behavior. Cholesterol is also important because it produces the steroid hormones, all the steroid hormones, as well as bile salts that are needed for the, for the absorption 
of, of fat-soluble uh, vitamins. Some of the risks that are associated with low cholesterol, and, and when I say low cholesterol, I'm talking about total cholesterol. So if cholesterol isn't, yeah, the type of cholesterol isn't indicated in the lab report, cholesterol by itself always means total cholesterol, which means uh, all of the fractions, the HDL, the LDL, and the VLDL um, associated cholesterol. So low total cholesterol is associated with increased cancer, increased violent behavior and aggression, increased susceptibility to uh, to infection, anxiety, suicide, depression, bipolar, and actually in older individuals, meaning higher than 70, uh, individuals with cholesterol less than 160 have double the death rate of people who have cholesterol of 230. So it is, in my view, it is a really stupid thing to be given uh, statins to older, to older adults uh, at all, since cholesterol is protective in, in uh, older adults. It also, low cholesterol is associated with increased stroke rate, increased cataracts. The study I just showed, the increased rate of school suspension, and several studies have also shown individuals with low cholesterol have difficulty kicking their uh, cocaine addiction. And what I hypothesize is the reason that people are going to cocaine is because they, their neurons don't have enough cholesterol so that the, the nerves can't be easily stimulated or they're not transmitting their signals well enough because of the low amounts of myelin. So cholesterol is extensively uh, entrapped in the, in the myelin, in the axons, and so forth. So if there's not enough cholesterol, there's not enough adequate neurotransmission, so the person may be uh, going to cocaine in an attempt to self-medicate because their brain's not, uh, not working adequately. Uh, we also tested the apolipoproteins, which are the cholesterol uh, transport proteins, the uh, apolipoprotein A, which is associated with the uh, HDL cholesterol, was normal. The apolipoprotein B uh, was low, and this is the most common thing that we find. Individuals who are low in cholesterol commonly have low amounts of the apolipoprotein B. Uh, again, apolipoprotein B is associated with LDL cholesterol. People are thought, are, are pushed to the idea that this is bad cholesterol, but many studies have shown that there are beneficial effects of, uh, of, uh, of LDL cholesterol. So, so the so-called bad cholesterol is not always bad. So, there, so just like you can have too little cholesterol, you can have also too little uh, LDL cholesterol as well. And, and uh, the low values of the LDL cholesterol is one of the unique biochemical factors that were found in a very nice study done by mass spectrometry in which they looked at uh, 6,348 proteins in the serum of children with autism. There were four proteins that were consistently abnormal, and the, one of the common abnormalities was this apolipoprotein B, the protein associated with, with the LDL cholesterol, and it was found those who had the lowest amount of this apolipoprotein B had the most severe form of autism. So what this indicates is that, that apolipoprotein B and cholesterol itself are very important uh, in development, and having uh, low amounts of of so-called bad cholesterol isn't necessarily good. Now, going back to the child's, uh, this is a, a little bit older version um, of the IgG test, but again, uh, severe allergies to milk. In this case, case, the goat's milk was okay, so he could use this as a possible substitute. 
he, he also had uh, allergies to beans, a very high allergy to uh, uh, lemon, some allergy to wheat, and also allergies to eggs. So unfortunately, because of the egg allergy, um, he couldn't just increase his uh, egg intake. This would be a child who it would be better to uh, supplement with uh, cholesterol. So this is the summary of his uh, uh, allergies. And it, it's been found that, that uh, various uh, allergies are associated with intestinal abnormalities. If you remember, the child complained of stomach pain. And this is showing the uh, endoscopy of the ileum, showing these uh, large um, nodules uh, due to expansion of, um, of lymphoid tissue. And some can, these can sometimes be the size of a grapefruit and can be so large that sometimes they uh, impair the, the uh, movement of the, uh, of the food and can lead to uh, uh, constipation. So it's been, it's been uh, shown in this particular article in the, uh, in the Lancet that non-IgE mediated food allergy, in other words, IgG mediated food allergy, uh, can be associated with this uh, ileolymphoid nodular hyperplasia that was first brought to the world by uh, uh, Wakefield, the, the, uh, the person who was attacked so severely for the article that said that that um, this particular abnormality might be linked with the uh, measles vaccine. So, of course, he was, um, if they still burn people at the stake, they probably would have burned him at the stake. But the thing that hasn't been shown is that, that uh, his findings about this ileal lymphoid nodular hyperplasia uh, as, that he first brought up uh, are prevalent in autism, and this has been re reproduced by uh, gastroenterologists throughout the world, even, even though he was severely attacked somewhat unfairly for his, for his uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine work. Uh, Dr. Belanti at Georgetown found that, that food allergies were much more prevalent on children with uh, ADHD, so he found that 56% of those with ADHD had positive food allergy tests versus only 6 to 8% in the children in the general population. So, so both, both uh, autism, ADHD, as well as all the psychiatric disorders, food allergy test is a, a, an extremely important test. Uh, now transitioning to a, another topic. Uh, that is the copper-zinc balance. And this is the average amount of these two metals in the uh, entire body, uh, a, a very small amount of copper and a huge amount of zinc. So zinc is much, much higher than the amount of copper uh, in the body. And the, the ratio of these two is extremely important. And copper is a very difficult one because Copper is an essential element, and so a slight deficiency of copper can lead to uh, clinical symptoms, but a slight excess of copper can also uh, lead to uh, a person who's not functioning well on all uh, eight cylinders. So copper is one of the more difficult uh, trace elements to, uh, to deal with because, because the, the the uh, dynamic range of, of, uh, of clinical health associated with copper is so narrow. <clears throat> uh, this indicates the, um, the dynamics of copper and zinc in the bloodstream. So copper is bound to a protein called uh, ceruloplasmin. Each molecule of ceruloplasmin, ceruloplasmin is this long bar, each, each molecule of the protein ceruloplasmin can bind six molecules of copper. In addition, uh, copper can also bind to a protein 
that's in the red blood cell. So ceruloplasmin is in the serum. Uh, metallothionine, a, 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 a protein that helps with, pr protects against uh, heavy metal toxicity, so uh, is in the red blood cell. Metallothionine uh, can transport both copper and zinc where ceruloplasmin only, transpo only transports copper. The, there is not a zinc transport protein in the bloodstream uh, in the serum. The, the zinc is all, uh, all the zinc in the serum is associated with uh, serum enzymes for which zinc is a cofactor. Uh, if the copper is not bound to ceruloplasmin, it becomes very toxic. So ceruloplasmin neutralizes copper toxicity, but if the amount of copper exceeds the amount of spots available for ceruloplasmin, it can be very toxic. And now back to our hyperactive patient. So uh, he has high am amounts of total copper. Uh, the bars going to the right indicate excess. The bars going to the left indicate deficiency. The zinc was on the uh, lower edge of the of normal. The the non-ceruloplasmin copper, meaning the free copper, the copper uh, not bound to ceruloplasmin, was very high. So it's in the abnormal range with high, and the copper zinc ratio is near two, whereas the normal ratio is about. Uh, 1.0. Uh, copper is very toxic because the, the free copper reacts with uh, superoxide uh, radicals and that converts it to copper 1 which can react with hydrogen peroxide forming hydroxy radicals which are extremely dangerous. They cause DNA oxidation and breakage in the DNA strands lipid oxidation, protein damage, and they also help destroy vitamin C. So even the person who's taking enough vitamin C, if they have high amounts of this excess free copper, this vitamin C can be destroyed uh, very rapidly. So even the person taking uh, high doses of vitamin C might lose it all in a short period of time if they have high copper. Uh, a person named Pfeiffer who who eventually formed what was called the Pfeiffer Institute, was very interested in this copper-zinc imbalance. And, and he was also interested in the fact that zinc is present in very high amounts in the brain, and so is very important. As a matter of fact, iron and zinc are approximately almost in equal amounts in the brain. So in his practice, he used zinc uh, for, for treating disorders like schizophrenia, Wilson's disease, which is a, a, a copper, um, a disease of um, a defective copper transport, ADHD, and also alcoholism. And the reason he used zinc, because most of these, uh, in most of these conditions, the copper was unduly high. So the person had a uh, excess of copper. So the the zinc is used to compete with copper and to reduce the amount of copper in the body. So they're similar in structures and in the chemical structures, and so increasing zinc helps to reduce copper. Uh, the ultimate copper disease is uh, storage disease is Wilson's disease, and you can see here uh, in the uh, brain that was uh, uh, looked at at autopsy, the, the whole brain has got deposits of the uh, copper uh, throughout, throughout the brain, which causes severe brain damage. So virtually every psychiatric disorder is associated with excess copper. In Wilson's disease, uh, there's virtually every kind of psychiatric symptom, uh, temper tantrums, inability to focus and concentrate, loss of emotional control, depression, insomnia, drooling, speech impairment, uh, hypo or hyperactivity, difficulty in controlling facial muscles, tremors. So uh, moving on, homocysteine was also elevated. Homocysteine requires 
three vitamins to detoxify it. High homocysteine is associated with many psychiatric disorders, increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, increased risk of, of uh, heart disease. So we had a high homocysteine. Uh, homocysteine, uh, effective homocysteine metabolism requires vitamin B6, as well as 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate and B12. So any one of these vitamin deficiencies could lead to uh, excess homocysteine. Uh, in addition, the hair test revealed high amounts of toxic metals. Again, the further the bar goes to the right, the more toxic. And the one here on the bottom is a very important one. The total toxic representation indicates a severe uh, toxic load um, with uh, the ones that are most clinically significant are uh, high amounts of uranium, uh, significant high amounts of lead, uh, high amounts of arsenic, antimony, and aluminum. So one, two, three, four, uh, five metals are really uh, significantly high, indicating that uh, toxic exposure uh, could be uh, a major portion of this individual's uh, hyperactivity. Uh, high amounts of lead are associated with uh, reduced reading scores and IQ. So here you see low amounts of lead uh, associated with an average reading score, and as lead continues to go up, the uh, reading ability goes down. And there's just tons of articles now that indicate even the lowest amount of lead, even values of lead below the, the um, that are getting near the detection limit have been found to cause uh, increased uh, psychiatric disorder. So even a, even a value of lead, a blood lead of one and a half is associated with some, uh, some increased uh, incidence of depression. Uh, also, the increase in lead is associated with, with uh, loss of IQ as well. And this is a nice study because this is using hair lead. Uh, some people are reluctant to use hair tests. I myself have found it extremely uh, useful as a uh, screening method, and this is a published study. Sorry, I didn't put in the reference here, but the, uh, the individuals, as the amount of hair lead goes up, the amount of teacher-reported hyperactivity goes up. So the children with the very highest amount of, of lead uh, have more hyperactivity. The child is right in this category than next to the highest category, so it's not surprising he has hyperactivity. Uh, and also looked at his essential uh, elements, and one of the things that was of concern is that he had high amounts of manganese, which is also associated with hyperactivity. So manganese is another element, like copper. Uh, manganese is an essential element, but higher than usual values are associated with illness. So this is um, the brains particularly affected by manganese excess. Symptoms of manganese excess include disorientation, memory loss, anxiety, emotional instability, and bipolar-like behaviors, aberrant or violent behaviors, and tremors or Parkinson's disease. So here's another uh, clinical uh, Pearl, which is you, you really should be evaluating all patients with Parkinson's disease with this metals test, and the high manganese is a common uh, association with Parkinson's, and it can be removed and uh, with, with uh, benefit to the patient by reducing the symptom, Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, a study in an excellent journal, Environmental Health, Health Perspectives, indicates that high hair manganese is associated with hyperactive behaviors. They did a study of boys and girls uh, in which there were two wells in which they were getting the water. One well had much higher amounts of manganese in the well. The other one that was lower. And those that had, of course, those who 
had the, the well with high manganese, had higher manganese in the hair, and, and they found that manganese in the hair was associated with two negative behavior scales, oppositional and hyperactivity, with very high uh, statistical significance rating. So all children with abnormal uh, oppositional and hyperactivity scores had elevated hair manganese, which this child has. Uh, the immune deficiency uh, commonly shows things. This particular test, it wasn't uh, extremely beneficial, but the IgG4 is a type, is one of the antibodies uh, in serum, and that is associated with food allergies, and you notice the value is 95, so it's near the upper limit of normal, indicating that food allergy uh, is probably a very important uh, aspect in this child's hyperactivity. The child had a uh, high amount of the candida marker, also some elevated oxalates. Uh, there was a moderate uh, amount of methylmalonic acid. The elevation indicates a deficiency of B12. Uh, extremely high values, meaning values of 100 or more, can be associated with uh, with uh, genetic disease, uh, lower uh, amounts that are still elevated, like this one, indicate nutritional deficiencies or dysbiosis. Vitamin C deficiency was present uh, as well. And, and, uh, and I want to talk about, so this study showed that, that uh, vitamin C was one of the factors related to ADHD and that supplementation with the omega-3 fatty acid flaxseed oil uh, together with vitamin C caused a significant uh, reduction in ADHD scores on the, on the Connors ADHD uh, scale. Looking at the stool test, it was found that the child had candida that was isolated, but when candida is examined under the microscope, it was found that there were a significant amount of yeast seen under the microscope. So sometimes the microscopic exam is more useful than the, than the culture. So the culture is indicating a modest increase, whereas the microscopic exam is indicating uh, much more. So antifungal treatment is needed for this child. The child's yeast was cultured, and it was found that it was sensitive for all of the common uh, prescription drugs, fluconazole, diflucan, and so forth. Uh, in addition, it was sensitive to many of the natural agents that can be used as uh, over-the-counter, with the exception of Tanelvit, in which the candida was resistant. So to summarize this child with, uh, with um, uh, ADD and ADHD, he had low cholesterol, low cholesterol transport protein, apolipoprotein B, severe allergies, uh, had an imbalance of, of uh, the, the copper and zinc, so he had high serum copper. He had high amounts of the free copper, which is the non-ceruloplasmin uh, copper. And, and uh, we, I just want to tell all of you who may be overwhelmed by this at first is that we have extensive consultation that's available for myself, and also we have a, uh, a biochemist with a master's degree who's also is very familiar with all of these tests and can, can uh, give you directions if I'm not available. Uh, the child had high homocysteine, high amounts of arsenic, lead, uh, aluminum, uranium, and antimony uh, in the toxic metal category, but also in the usually beneficial category, the, the manganese was elevated and in, in the range that's associated with hyperactivity and other uh, behavioral uh, abnormalities. The child had low vitamin C. The immune system was normal with the exception that the IgG4 uh, markers were on the high end of normal. They had uh, high, the child had high oxalates high methylmalonic acid indicating B12 deficiency, so need some additional B12. Uh, the candida was present on the uh, stool test and also on 
a candida marker on the organic acid test. They also, the, the stool test showed low amounts of the uh, beneficial bacteria, the lactobacillus. The candida was sensitive to most of the common prescription and over-the-counter agents. So some of the questions for follow-up, uh, which probably have not been done satisfactorily, where are the, where's the toxic metals coming from? Of course, in this case, advise the parents to use uh, the uh, reverse osmosis water since there's possibility that their water supply could be contaminated with uh, uh, manganese, so it might be a good idea to switch to the use of the purified water. And, and what about the uh, history of infection, um, frequent ear infections and things like that? Could that have contributed to the candida problems? Um, what about the reason for the, the, uh, the, some of the reasons for the low cholesterol? Uh, some of the foods that can be used to increase cholesterol were eggs, but remember the child had egg allergy. Uh, some of the other are liver and brain, but these are not commonly things that are um, kid foods that most kids are comfortable with, although there's uh, exceptions in every case. Did the child have a diet high in oxalates that the dietary differences can be, can be dietary changes could be suggested uh, to do this. The child had, um, the, the child will need to be put on a diet uh, low in milk, without milk because of the food allergy test, so it's very important to give calcium supplementation to make up for that. The common, the the most common dose used for, for calcium supplementation from children on two, on, two up to uh, adult is 1,000 a, a milligrams a day, preferably in, uh, with, with uh, divided into uh, three meals. And, the, and is the child getting enough vitamins because of some of the vitamin deficiencies noted? So the treatment plan that was that was put together was to eliminate the toxic sources of metals, put the child on the purified water, use uh, DMPS suppositories to reduce the toxic elements for three to six months, uh, and, and to uh, either add cholesterol or liver, depending on, on, on what the child could tolerate, to monitor cholesterol every three months. You want to maintain cholesterol in what I consider the optimal range, which is 160 to 200 milligrams per uh, deciliter. Uh, zinc would be supplemented at 25 to 50 milligrams a day uh, to reduce the copper, but continue, the test needs to be repeated to make sure that it's working, and if the copper doesn't go down enough, you might have to uh, increase the zinc for a period of time. Elimination diet was, was done to eliminate those foods that were in the high or moderate category. I mentioned you'll need to supplement with calcium and also uh, magnesium on a continuing basis. One of the things I want to emphasize is that there are two uh, elements that have extremely similar names, but you need to get them straight. Magnesium is the is the trace element that is given in very large amounts. Manganese is the one that the child had excess, and manganese is one that can be commonly toxic and is present at only very trace amounts in comparison to magnesium. Uh, calcium and magnesium citrate are very useful to help to reduce the oxalates that the child had. Um, Antifungal treatment is very important, and, and even though it seems excessive, my experience and the experience of physicians who treat candida on a regular basis is that the treatment should generally be for three to six months with a low sugar diet, that you can get rid of candida in a shorter period of time, but you can't you can't get rid of it to good, and it may be back in a very short period of time if you don't do treatment that's long enough. 
The reason probably has to do with the fact that candida, um, candida is associated predict products that impair immune function. And so the immunity is severely weakened by the candida infection. So you need an extensive period of time free of candida for the immune system to uh, reconstitute from its, from its uh, a, a assault by the uh, candida immune toxins. <clears throat> you can remove some of the high oxalate foods from the diet. They include spinach, soy, chocolate, peanuts, and other nuts. The complete uh, list is on the Great Plains website. The Great Plains Laboratory, by the way, is one of the uh, few laboratories in the world that include uh, oxalate uh, on all the organic acid tests. A multivitamin supplement with 50 milligrams of B6 a day uh, and, and, and this nutritional recommendation is based on the high homocysteine. Because of that, 50 milligrams of B6, 3 to, th 3 to 4,000 micrograms of folate, and 1,000 micrograms of, of uh, B12 or cyanocobalamin to help to, to uh, eliminate the excess homocysteine. Um, and then, although in this case the, the fatty acid test wasn't done, it's very common for, for, for many individuals to the, in, uh, in to consuming the Western diet, if they're not eating a high fish intake, uh, the recommendation would be to, to supplement perhaps with 2,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA and 500 milligrams of uh, carnitine and uh, repeat the organic acid after three months to make sure that the therapy has been successful. And although they weren't tested, a number of studies have shown that uh, food dyes, artificial colors, monosodium glutamate, and NutraSweet can be harmful in causing uh, hyperactivity and abnormal behavior. So the results at six months, the report from the clinician the parents say we have a new kid, the school behavior is no longer disruptive, the aggressive behavior has significantly decreased, the, the child's attentive to learning, able to sit and play with peers, the ears and the cheek have a normal appearance, there is, is uh, uh, no significant in incidence of the otitis media, and the child is, uh, they, they're saying he's going to be able to uh, handle uh, kindergarten. So uh, thank you all very much, and I'll see if I can figure out uh, if, um, if uh, we have some questions. You can type in the questions, and then I will try to uh, answer them in order. And if you want to go back, I realize this was a, a lot of material. If you want to go back to any particular slides, uh, I'll be glad to, uh, uh, to uh, go back. So uh, if you can uh, type in your questions, then I c I'll be able to, to uh, see them. But thank you all for attending, and it was a, it was a, it was a, a great pleasure to be here tonight. So let's see. Questions. OK, I found the questions. Okay, worry about it. Okay, so it'll be just a second. I'm scrolling down. Um, this is a good question. What amount of EFA would you consider to be excessive? So one of the answers to this is talk about to the the group that gets the most, it's estimated that the, that the uh, Eskimos eating their wild diet, you know, before, before they're getting uh, Cheerios uh, from, the, from the base store, were probably getting 20,000 milligrams a day of omega-3. Um, in the 
the uh, uh, the study of, of stoles of using omega-3 for treating bipolar disorder, he was using uh, 10,000 milligrams a day of omega-3. Uh, I have seen some, uh, some indications that, that there is such a thing as excess omega-3 and, and that too much omega-3, it, it, it depresses the immune system. So, so remember that some inflammation is good and some of this uh, immunity is good. So too much omega-3 could, could possibly lead to a, 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 um, an impairment of immunity so the person might not be able to fight infection. So inflammation in moderation can be a very good thing in fighting an injury or illness. But the problem if it's getting out of hand. So to some degree, I would say if the person has a disease, you can look at the symptoms to know uh, if they've uh, cleared up. So if the person with arthritis doesn't have pain anymore, then you're giving the, the uh, right amount. If you're, you know, if you're giving omega-3 fatty acids and the person is still is saying they still have arthritis pain, I'd be inclined to um, to increase that. The, uh, a large number of the gurus in the fatty acid field are saying that this, that this uh, uh, one to one to two to one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is ideal. So if you can do blood testing, I mean, that's the ideal thing. And so in the past, I didn't recommend this much, but in, in looking at how, uh, how important uh, this particular ratio is in health, I think it's worth it to do it at least one time to see uh, when you're taking your regular amount of fish oil and seeing are you approaching this beneficial range of two. Um, so I would say actually if you're in the, if the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is four or less, you're probably doing okay. And most people think the optimum range is the value of uh, two. I think I would be very comfortable in saying anybody who has any major health issue at all could be getting 3,000 milligrams of uh, omega-3. So that's a, a, a pretty uh, pretty uh, large uh, amount, and the. Um, as far as the the bleeding and so forth, uh, I think that most people are putting the, this warning in mainly as a CYA that that even though there's some increase in, in risk, that even people who are on um, uh, uh, on blood thinners, some of them have still been able to take moderate amounts of omega three without causing a problem, but but it, it's, it's almost always put out there as a warning. So I'm going to put the same warning out there. But my impression is that, is that the warning is, has been overdone. Um, evidence of diet. OK, so the next one, has there been any evidence of diet or nutritional deficiency uh, contributing to the uh, the trichotillomania, uh, and this one, I am almost sure that there is, but unfortunately, I I don't remember it, and I am almost positive that this came up in a seminar that I was at, but I've I've lost that uh, bit of information. Um, if you'll uh, email me, you know, offline, you know, my email is William S H A at AOL com. I'll look and see if I can find that reference because I'm almost sure there is a uh, a relationship there. Uh, okay. How about the next question? How about food allergies with this? Uh, um, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this uh, correctly. Trichotillomania. Uh, uh, um, I have found food allergies associated with virtually every illness 
and every uh, every kind of condition under the sun and so I strongly recommend that the food allergy testing to anyone who has a recurrent or chronic disease you may find that the food allergy test may help out. Uh, do you worry about sulfur uh, production in foods? Uh, sulfur production, um, now one thing I know there, there is the uh, extreme sensitivity to sulfites that were put in in salad bars that for people who have certain biochemical uh, abnormalities or or polymorphisms have difficulty detoxifying uh, sulfites and so people some people have had very severe reactions and perhaps even death uh, when when the uh, the sulfites were sprinkled uh, on the food. So that can be a, a major thing. Uh, and then there's the question of the, the arabinose, the oxalate, the severe kynurenic wall high range. Um, does this profile when accompanied by elevated uh, epinephrine norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, GABA suggest a certain picture in a nine-year-old with slower learning and high activity. Well, um, okay, here's what I find is that, that I mean, it's kind of, it, it's kind of a surprise, but uh, elevated amounts of uh, norepinephrine and dopamine metabolites are frequently associated with heavy metals. So, so one of the things I would think about is, is um, I would think about doing the, the uh, heavy metals, but the, the, um, with the elevated um, uh, arabinose, of course, I think candida. So in my experience, the two most common things that are associated with hyperactivity and this is after looking at, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of cases, and you know, most of these in consultation, has been uh, heavy metals, but especially lead. So lead, in my experience, is one of the most toxic metals in our environment, and it's extremely common. And and even lead values in the high end of the normal range can be associated with. Uh, with uh, with with hyperactivity, and the second factor is the candida. So, the candida and the uh, lead are the two most common uh, major causes of hyperactivity. All of these other things can contribute: the omega three fatty acid deficiency, the high manganese. So, you saw in this particular case of the boy with hyperactivity. He had multiple metals, which is a very common profile, plus high manganese, plus high copper. So all of these could be contributing uh, to the hyperactivity. And this is why this sample uh, was just, I mean, was really just uh, taken at random. So I don't, so this was not, I want to emphasize, this was not an unusual case. This is the, the most common cases are associated with these multiple factors which is why this profile effect can be very useful in, in, uh, in reversing these illnesses without the, without the use of, uh, uh, of, uh, of drugs. And I'm going on now to the, is there a risk of oxidative stress with high EP and DHA dosing? Ah, a very important question, yes. So you can cause the oxy uh, the the problem is with these polyunsaturated fatty acids are very uh, prone to oxidation. So it's very important to have enough antioxidants. Like uh, so, having adequate amount of vitamin C and having adequate amounts of of vitamin E, which is a fat soluble antioxidant, are important and there's another substance that I think they, it's, there's indication it's uh, even better as an antioxidant for protecting 
all these high amounts of omega-3 fatty acid, which is the uh, TOCA trienols, which are related to vitamin E. So the name is TOCA trienol, is spelled T-O-C, uh, T-O-C-A, T-R-I-E-N-O-L. So the TOCA, TOCA trienols are especially important for, um, for uh, their antioxidant um, uh, antioxidant uh, ability. Um, another question, how do you address giving omega-3 fatty acids to in persons with impaired uh, fat digestion? Um, I'd say this would be a case if the person has impaired fat digestion, then you would consider um, giving uh, enzymes. So there's wide spectrum enzymes. A uh, number of companies have these. My, my my own supplement company has it, and there's many others. My supplement companies, New Beginnings, they, they have these uh, uh, wide-spectrum uh, digestive enzymes that include uh, fat digestive enzymes as well as, as uh, uh, proteases and, and so forth. So, so um, digestive enzymes can be uh, very helpful in that case. Okay, uh, now the question is with, um, in someone with, uh, and there's a question about uh, someone with low cholesterol, but I'm, I'm missing somehow. I'm, uh, uh, okay, if the, if the person has impaired fat digestion, the, the, Cholesterol would best be given with um, with with other fatty uh, foods together together with these digestive enzymes that include uh, digestive enzymes that digest fat like uh, phospholipase and lipase uh, enzymes in in the product. So it would probably be best to be given the cholesterol together with other uh, high-fat foods because the cholesterol will be absorbed the best under those circumstances. And, and uh, I just want to, um, to indicate that it would be um, that you don't really have to worry too much about giving too much cholesterol. I mean, it's really been the opposite that when these, these people with low cholesterol, so a lot of these are pretty um, uh, resistant to increasing their cholesterol. And, and also I want to give the simple rule of thumb on how, to, on how to dose cholesterol that's worked out pretty well, which is you subtract the patient's cholesterol from 160. So if the patient, patient had a cholesterol value of 100, for example, 160 minus 100 is 60. So you then divide by 10, 60 divided by 10 is 6. So the person would need uh, six, six capsules of cholesterol or six eggs a day or a combination they could eat three eggs a day plus three cholesterol capsules a day um, in order to bring their cholesterol back to normal over a period of a, of a couple of months. So what's surprising is that in some cases it's taken really extended time periods and there are some individuals who are somewhat resistant. So even given some uh, substantial cholesterol supplement, there are as like a perhaps a 20 or 30 percent of the groups may be, uh, have real difficulty in raising their, their uh, serum uh, cholesterol with supplementation. So, uh, uh, and oh, you're you're right. In in the Canadian, um, the Canadian term, it would be uh, they use the millimoles instead of milligrams. So, in Canadian or uh, I think the UK, they use millimoles, so values less than 4.12 would be uh, considered 
uh, deficient. I think I may have put these on our, I think I may have added this information on our website. Um, if, you, if you want to learn how to convert these, um, you, can, you can look at, um, you, you can Google that. You know, it's, everything is on Google now. You can, um, you can, you can write um, uh, conversion of cholesterol to SI units. That's conversion of cholesterol to uh, SI, uh, SAMI, um, SAMI uh, Indian SI, um, and uh, and and you can do the uh, uh, you can get the exact commercial. I'm pretty sure it's on our website, but I'm not absolutely certain. And by the way, the Great Plains website uh, is. It has an extensive section on cholesterol, and it has the references. I didn't, for some of these disorders associated with low cholesterol, I didn't give the references, but a large percentage of those scientific references are on the website if you want to uh, get those uh, website, if, if you want to look on the website and get that uh, information. And, and let's... Okay, another question. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. I just wanted to bring up, of course, the the Sedona conference is coming up. It's in a, one of the most beautiful areas of the world. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's in a uh, a nice time of the year. The summer heat is gone. Plus, it's at a high enough elevation. It should be perfect weather. Uh, so for those who haven't been to one of these conferences or you want to go to another one, this is a great opportunity. Uh, look on our website. You can, uh, it's available. You can sign up now, uh, the S Sedona IMMH conference, and it's in, it's in September. Uh, the, you, the, the, uh, there's been an excellent rate for the lodging there, but it's also one of the most popular times of the year. So, so we got an excellent rate, but don't wait till the last minute. You need to get your your uh, room reservation uh, just right away. I mean, I'd be reserving it tomorrow if I were you. If you really want to go to the conference, to make sure you get a really excellent rate on the room. These are these are just average rooms, though. So those of you who look for who want uh, you know a nicer hotel. There's one just down the street, and it has the the uh, location there. But we'll be covering all this, the, the things that I talked about tonight in great detail, and I think you'll find it all very useful. And and uh, with this information, you, you can do what you want to do, which is restore people who have bad health to good health, because that's that is really what it's all about. And... With this kind of information, I think that you can that you can access in Sedona, uh, you'll be able to uh, to start to do this. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm always available in con for consultation. Uh, you can just set up an appointment with my uh, with my secretary. If I'm traveling, my my uh, uh, biochemist Pam is also very knowledgeable about these things and could also uh, uh, help you out, and uh, just want to say is that that uh, I'm I'm going to be there together with uh, uh, Dr. James uh, Greenblatt uh, and Dr. Katie and Dr. Waller, who have all used this integrative uh, approaches in their practice, and they'll be glad to share that. In addition, uh, Dr. Greenblatt will be doing another one of these. Uh, clinical grand rounds uh, on June 8th so uh, be sure to look for that and I think you'll uh, I think you'll enjoy uh, Dr. Greenblatt's talk uh, very much so uh, thank you again uh, very much and I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be uh, signing out thank you thank you all very